Scholars have pointed out that the many depictions of the devil were also inversions or reflections of the real world and the changes taking place in medieval society. The changes created great anxiety in people and the devil was an effective symbol to receive those projections and fears. Robert Muschenblatt has some very interesting and very cogent ideas concerning what those changes were. Towns were emerging with their conveniences but attendant evils. It was a period of great consolidation of power, not only by the church but also the state, and the two were seen in tandem. Laws of the state and church doctrine were both being consolidated. It was a long period of the civilizing process of the West. There were new ways of seeing the human body, the world, and the ways by which societies could be bound together, states Mushin Blood. The true issue was power, whether ecclesiastical or civil. The devil enshrined in hell was not only an inverse mirror of the king's sacred position or the state's civil power, but also a fearful symbol reflecting the ordinary man's anxiety about being swallowed up by, by such all-encompassing power structures. It was the birth of a triumphant culture which says Munchenblatt externalized individual guilt, moral and religious in origin, into a global interpretation defined by a sense of superiority and expansion. Europe moved away from an enchanted inertia and adopted a hierarchical social model around a god more powerful than the terrible Lucifer. But the anxieties of ordinary people during this time of extreme change were quick to fasten onto an ever more powerful Lucifer, who had not lost his hold on the people's imaginations, despite church teachings to the contrary. And then, more disquieting events began to take place, the most significant being the Reformation and the challenge to the church triumphant. That will be the subject of our next lecture, the devil's role during the conflict between the Catholic Church and its Protestant rival. Thank you for your attention. Very good. Very, very good. Very nice. This celebrates uh, one year of our coming together. L'chaim. This is the, the end of the old, the beginning of the new. Yes, sir. The first lecture of the, of the new year. Yes, sir. Yay. Congratulations on one year of atheist scholar. Thank you. And a lot more to come. <laughs> so the, your, your second half is a continuation of the history of the devil. So yes. Mm -hmm. Just so that I don't ask questions that. Yeah. No, because we're going to go into the Reformation. In, in the next. Um, Reformation. Reformation. Uh, you know uh, the the story of garden the Garden of Eden. Wouldn't that be the first reference to the devil in the Bible? I don't believe so. The snake was was if not Satan, he was a representative of yeah, Satan. Yeah, but see, they, they made it that way after. It's just a talking snake. Remember, there's a lot of versions of Genesis. Yeah, but, but even in the, I'm speaking of the Jewish version. But you have about a million versions of that, if you look back. I, I think... Uh, there's the weird consensus. stories about Adam and Eve. Yeah, there is, and I'm going to ask you some more about that. But, but no, I think the consensus is, is that the snake was a representative of Satan. Well, maybe that's a cons but do, does it yeah. say so exactly? Well, in the earliest versions, because it doesn't. You have to understand that, that all of the, the Bible uh, has been interpreted. Yeah. That, you know, we can, we can read the literal, literal accounts, but there's all the bodies of exegesis that comes but we have to follow what's actually in the text. Well, but you see, you, you, that's, not, that's not the biblical, uh, the theological approach. They don't, they don't just rely on what the... What see, that's see. what's incorrect, and that's But it's not newer, incorrect. It's part no, of that's the... No, the newer interpretations are more, you know, like cultural and what have you, and not theological. They were trying to make a point. They were trying to take that devil back. You know, we had this perfectly formulated devil already. That's what, I, that's what I was taught in school, too. It's not right. But, well, because the, the text is often uh, ambiguous, you cannot say this is the pure version that, that predates the interpretations. We don't have that pure version. We, we have what was finally written down after years of but passing. But you have, like, different versions of that. You know, there, there's, there's the translations, but no, there, there is no, uh, 
you know, if, if you wanted a consensus among the Jewish theologians, for example, of what's the, what's the Hebrew or what's the Aramaic uh, version, I think they would, they would be able to come up with a consensus of this is what the But would you take it version. necessarily? I mean, the Catholics have the same damn thing. So the, 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 the Catholics a little bit more, you know, number of years uh, of translations. I don't, I, don't, I don't know because I'm not a biblical scholar, but I do know that they wouldn't just say, well, it's just these words, the, sn the snake is not the devil. I think that the, the people who were reading and were, even before it was written would have interpreted the snake as the devil. Okay, well, I mean, I think that you, know, you know, I'm not an expert in this field, but I'm going to go with Pagels and some of the other experts because I think, you know, they're, they're leaning on, on a lot of biblical you know, uh, interpretations that, you know, are maybe not always in accord, but I, I like their interpretations. That the know. snake was not the devil? Who knows what he was. He was a counterintuitive kind but, of a thing. You know, because of the... the uh, Remember, he's, the snake is a traditional enemy of humankind because he creeps around. You know, I mean, seriously, I mean, that's why... Um, they say that there's many reasons why we're afraid of them, probably because yeah. they're not warm-blooded as we are, but also you, you can step on them. What do they do? They bite you. You can't see them, you know, before they kill you. They killed a lot of people. Yeah. So they're a fearsome. That would have been why they probably, whoever wrote this... Used the snake. Used the snake. I'm not yeah. doubting that. Uh, what about Lilith? Uh, I don't really know. that This is more of Jewish folklore, mm -hmm. uh, but, but there's this other woman from that right. time called Lilith, who was sort yeah. of the, the witch demon, yeah. or the Jewish uh, female devil. Yeah. Do you know there's anything another, about Yeah, there's another story, and now I, I don't have the book in front of me. Um, oh, God, I can't remember the writer. He's, um, he's one of the editors for Skeptic Magazine. Not Skeptical Inquiry, but Skeptic Magazine. I can't remember his name. I have the book at home if you would like to borrow it. Um, and he discusses some of these myths and everything and there's even the thing that uh, Lilith or some figure like Lilith like from pagan mythology is Eve and then she's disobedient or whatever so I don't know God get, does away with her I don't know what they do with her or send her to marry Satan some silly thing and then uh, then they make Eve and Eve comes along so she's like the first one and then there's also um, a queen bee which Robert Graves the um poet and also like mythologist, you know, a pretty good interpreter of mythology talks about very deep back. And it, I don't know if Lilith is, inter is you know, he, he wrote a long thing on the Queen Bee and it doesn't make much sense to me, but it's, it's a long tradition and it's one that the rabbis stamped out. So who knows? I have no idea, but there's these female figures. And then there was the figure of wisdom who uh, apparently before the vision of uh, Yahweh became monotheistic, if you recall, it was in one of my lectures, um, was a consort of gods and helped rule with him. Mm -hmm. Was a woman? Yeah, yeah, wisdom, you know. And then, it, and then wisdom is sent on the earth to like try to get humans to like, I don't know, behave or whatever. And then Christ is like merged with wisdom in a way. So there's different stories. See, I mean, they're, they're just too, too odd. But they're they're all interesting, you know. If you're you know that deeply into the mythology of that that time, I'm trying to remember the author's name. This is terrible. Um, he's really very very good. He he knows all kinds of languages. He has studied the mythology deeply, and it, it's just an excellent book. He he shows all the names and how they were changed in the in the Hebrew and then Christian tradition from the pagans. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, that's commonly known. I mean, you know, they, the Christians incorporated so much. But apparently the Jews did too, more than, more than I realized. From whom? From the pagans that they had associated with or heard of. Yeah, there's a lot of, well, cross-fertilization, everybody was hanging around there. It's like all those flood stories. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as my understanding is that the Jewish feminists wanted to reclaim Lilith that she had been given a bad name, and they reclaimed her as the, the powerful uh, female prototype for Jewish women as, as opposed to the devil. Well, they might have. This was the politically correct yeah, interpretation. Yeah. She had gotten a bad rap, 
as being the enemy of God. Instead, she was a powerful woman that the patriarchs didn't want to have around. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I think the patriarchs didn't want to like get into the issue of like what Yahweh was doing with these women, you know. And it looks like he was ma perhaps married. He well, apparently he was not um, uh, chased or whatever until you know later. God. Yeah, that you know that 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 he was. Um, what would you call it? Heterosexual. You want to call? I don't know what you would call it. Some version of Yah, you know, there's Which two. Which would have been the pagan idea of a god that that produces and reproduces. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I think early on, if you recall my thing in biblical criticism, there were two Yahwas, mm -hmm. one that was more theoretical and you know all powerful, and then one that was like mad a lot and walked the earth and talked to people, and how that was blended eventually. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that. These things all came from like different sources and were incorporated and evolved and, and changed. And you, you could get a, a, par a parallel structure of the, those two Yahwas with uh, God the Father and Jesus the Son. You've got it, exactly. That's a good point. I didn't think about that. Oh, yeah, just, it just flashes. Yeah, God is up there. And is, isn't, isn't the Jesus, aren't, don't they bend, uh, go out of their way to say, you know, Jesus was uh, not, you know, Engaged in uh, sexual activities. Yeah, that's what But then there's so another group that says Mary God, uh, Jesus was married. Yeah, had yeah. children and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's why they get so mad. That that silly story. What's it called? Um, the Da Vinci Code. Yeah, the Da Vinci mm -hmm. Code. That makes that point. That you know mm -hmm. he got to get. Well, you know, uh, we don't know. I mean, he might have been one of those uh, wandering magicians, and he may well have had sexual relations with, with women. You know, they sanitized him a great deal. I mean, there there would have there wouldn't have been any prohibition unless he was an Essene, which some people make the point that he was. Mm -hmm. Well, no, he he was not. But I don't he think was he not. was. No, I mean, well, there's about fifty versions of everybody's borrowed Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. so you know for their own purposes or how they've written it. As you recall from my biblical criticism, you know, the question of Jesus. So they see their own face in Jesus. So you would say, though, that, that the devil and sex were associated from the very beginning. Uh, these, Pretty close. Two Pretty phenomenons. close. It got worse. It got worse during the Reformation. It got a lot worse. Um, Here it's just kind how, of general evil, you know. But how uh, did they address the question of if God is omnipotent, then how would there be a devil? Well, see, that, that's the problem, and mm -hmm. that's why the Gnostics so cleverly solved it, and the Christians are still... That God was not perfect. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because Wrong the God. Gnostics have it exactly right, and, and that's... God the, is perfect, it's the other God, the evil yeah. God who... Yeah. And the atheologists God. are still using that point, mm -hmm. uh, that a creator, you don't need, God doesn't need to create anything if he's everything that the Christians say he is. Yeah. All powerful, all black, because he's perfect in himself. Well, why do you have this good. lack? To create, and the Gnostics solved it. But of course, that the church didn't want to say that you know that this world was made you know evil, mm -hmm. and that an evil God made it. So they had to wipe them out. But I think it was a very clever thing. And there were actually, I remember from reading um, the Alexandria Quartet by Lawrence Durrell that there were actually sects that were still studying that kind of thing in, in Alexandria. But among the mainstream Christians, though, how would they explain that? God allow the devil to live. They they still don't. They they still don't. They they have you know what's his name, um, uh, Plantinga like gives all kinds of explanations, but not, none of them make any sense at all. Because you could say, well, people might do evil things, and God has given them free will, and that's why sometimes they do evil things. But how would you explain that there's this devil running around? that only does evil things. That's it, see. How would, what, what purpose would that serve God? Only, I think, to explain the evil in the world and the fact that God isn't really responsible for it. He's got this divine plan, but even the devil, I think Platinga has said that the devil and the demons have some sort of free will. Now, I don't know why would God have created a bunch of uh, like angels like that that would have free will when I thought it was only humans. You see how none of it really holds together at all? No, it doesn't, but nevertheless, they have been challenged with this. I'm sure that people try to explain Yeah, it. they do, but it you see where it ends up. I mean, they think that they've 
that they won the argument every time. But that Satan was supposed to be a fallen angel, right? Yes. And that um, he originally was by God's side. Yeah, but you ones. notice that's later. That's later. We, earlier, in, in like in the Jewish thing, he's just this guy that God sends out. The spot. He's kind of this weak mm -hmm. little thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, not weak. I mean, he's powerful, but, you know, nowhere near the power that he assumes. By the time we get to the um, Milton, you know, Paradise Lost, I mean, he's a beautiful figure, Lucifer. Perverse, but I mean beautiful. I mean, he's like, he's a lot like Melville's uh, Captain Ahab, who's not so yeah. beautiful, but I mean, it's, it's there's a beautiful line when Ahab, you know, like he's so angry with the whale and God's nature as it is, as it yeah. is, and, and he said, I would strike the sun if it insult me. It's like perverse pride to the Christians. That's a beautiful line, and Lucifer is the same way. You, you think some Gorgeous. of these men they actually projected uh, homoerotic fantasy onto the devil, that somehow the devil was the sexual tempter or their own homosexual urges? Some of them might, but I think a lot of it was that through women. Because you know what, they wouldn't, they wouldn't write up, say, Aquinas when he was tempted by a devil or by a woman when he was doing his studies, you know, and he had a, like, banisher. I, I think that the, I don't think that they would write about homoerotic tendencies at that time. Well, they didn't write. I'm, I'm just asking you to speculate that, whether right. you think that maybe Why not? Projecting. Almost every, every um, now again, I can't think of the guy's name. Oh, the guy who wrote uh, Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan. He doesn't say exactly, but he talks about all kinds of, like, really terrible and wicked thoughts, sexual and, you know, murderous and what have you. So it might have been men and women. May, may have been sexual thoughts, and he had to put those down. So the devil had, you know, given that to him to hinder him. You know, I would think almost anything that we had been taught was not good was projected yeah. onto the devil. But you have to think about well, why would a man tempt another man to have sex with a woman, right? Oh, I see what you mean. So it would be like a um, the woman would be like a um, the the, the, the how woman. It, between, it, the two men? between the two men. Well, no, yeah. I'm just saying the devil at that point was now a, was a took a masculine form. Yeah. It, it didn't take a female form yeah. later on, right? Well, so, it, only in the form of witches, and they were subordinate to him. They were the servants. Okay. Yeah. So all I'm saying is it's kind of odd that they would say that this devil man was tempting me to have sex with a woman. You might be right, but don't don't forget too that. Um, what am I trying to say? That the devil wouldn't be a woman because women were like considered subordinate, almost animal-like. So you'd never, you'd never make a, a devil woman who would tempt anybody to have sex with anybody because a woman wouldn't be powerful like that. Only a witch. Yeah, only a witch, and only through her power with Satan, mm -hmm. who he sometimes had intercourse with her or left her his mark and blah, 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 you know. Yeah, I'm trying to psychoanalyze it. I know what you're doing, yeah. Further than what was simply stated. I know what you're doing, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you project your negative uh, feelings onto somebody else right. or some other thing, and you say, it's not me, it's this other thing that's doing this. But it, it had to be a masculine figure that would be that powerful at the time. Okay. This is my thinking. Yeah, because women didn't have any. Women had oh. no, no real, you know. Well, where, where's though the original uh, concept of making a deal with the devil? Where did that come from originally? You had mentioned about the, the ransom. early Faustian things. I think I think it's in. I believe it's in my next lecture. I have to review the text, but it was a lot of that was the Fa Faustian legends. Well, I was reminded by because you kept saying the ransom that was paid. That was a little different. That's like what we owed, you know, what we owed God. Did we owe that debt to God or the devil? Yeah, that was a little different. That was really early on. You see what they were doing at this time, and I, I, I hope I've made it really clear, was that they didn't, you know, all that, I know all the stuff that I was taught in school, at, at Catholic girls' school, you know, it made it sound as though this doctrine had been laid on pretty early. They did mention the Athanasius and, and you know, that thing and how, you know, Constantine laid down the thing. That was about it. But from then on, everything was supposed to be, like, uh, pretty kosher. And that really wasn't the case. I mean, for especially the first three centuries before 
the, those councils, but it was evolving all the time. The church fathers were trying to work something out, and then, you know, one church father would be would die, and he would be in less favor, or else they would revive him, and he'd be in more favor. So there was this constant play. I mean, things weren't really solidified for an awfully long time. Well, the Catholic I have Church long... did not resolve the problem of uh, uh, Mary, Mother of God, and her holiness. Right. They couldn't get her into heaven for until what, the 1700s, the 1800s? You didn't that? know that better because you had read Poggio. Yeah, right? I, I think that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of issues that were unresolved till the 1500s, 1200s, 1100s. You know, so they were working out all this stuff. I mean, as they went, almost by the seat of their pants, as it were, you know, and which church father had the most influence. I think Anselm actually, uh, after way after his death, they decided that, you know, like he was in great error, almost blasphemy sometimes or something. So that, that would come up. And Martian, who, you know, eliminated everything from the Old Testament, you know, he's, <laughs> you know, um, Doesn't he was considered a heretic later. Because they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to live in the Old Testament. Well, right. it, it, it destroys but, the prophecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, all this is just really, it's its all glued together very, very uh, thinly. And you'll see I have a very long lecture on, um, you know, the rise of the early church and its war on reason. And you'll see in there, because I'm talking a lot about the different councils and church doctrine, and actually, yeah, I'm giving away, but still, you know, um, it was the it was the emperors who who would lay it down sometimes because those Christians were like killing each other a lot of times the bishops and the different sects literally and so the emperors you know they wanted peace because they wanted you know things to progress in commerce and you know and everything like that so a lot of times they would like half threaten them into like resolving things with sweet words but nevertheless there was this iron fist behind you know. And, and they would just, sometimes they would just say, this is the way it's going to be, and that's the way it's going to be. And I think a lot of times they really didn't care. You know, they would either go with the majority party, or um, somebody had gotten to them and influenced them, or what have you. It was just like, let's have this and let's have some peace, basically. This is all these wonderful, you know, absolutist things laid down by God and the Pope and the, and the wonderful cardinals. It was a lot was of political. politics, a lot mm -hmm. of it was politics. What year was the movement of the free spirit? That was about from about uh, 1300 to 1500. And what country was that? It was like England and, and uh, Germany mainly, northern Europe, in the northern countries. And they did they call themselves Christian or no? Yeah, I think they saw themselves as Christian. When I read, um, I, I, I've, had, I've read his book fully because the, the situation has always interested me. But it was before the Reformation. Yeah, just a little before, yeah. You, yeah, I didn't know about the Cathars either. Yeah, it was yeah. Also, it was also, they were trying to break away from Catholicism. Right, yeah, that type of Catholicism, yeah. And so that's another thing, and Elaine Pagels has been really wonderful in some earlier scholars, and, and this, this Cohen guy, too, you know. They, that's another thing. The churches wipe, try to wipe out the memory of, of all these groups and sects, but there was a huge, a terrible fight going on. You know, who is going to have hegemony? What's going, you know, what's going to emerge? And, there were, and, and this Gnostic... Heresy, as it's called, under its different manifestations, was a huge challenge. Had they not been so individualized and focused on the inner person, I think that they might have won. But the church, you see, continued to institutionalize, institutionalize, institutionalize. And they, you always have an advantage when you have that power. Yeah, even, a, even today, there, there are uh, sects yeah. of, uh, yeah. in Catholicism yes. that will not uh, take the, from the consuls, take the uh, direction that the masses have to be said in the language of the country where you're preaching. There's little groups, too. And there's little there's, teeny groups there's some, all over I, the place. I know, I Only know use the Latin group. mass. And, I know a little group in Gross Point, and they meet in a house, and they're Catholics. I mean, come on. Because <laughs> they're more conservative than the conservatives. It's continuous. Like, what? It has not and died. It has many not of them died out. It's still going on. You know? Yeah. And they have very strict, you know, There's a, a branch of Catholicism in Lithuania that has survived Stalin and everybody, and it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's this continuous struggle, 
And believe me, you know, the church wouldn't have been in such a great position had not Constantine decided to, to use that as his instrument. It, was, it had gotten pretty powerful. There were some cities that was in the majority, but in general in the empire it was still somewhat in the minority. And uh, he adopted it, maybe because it was a new game in town, whatever, but he chided them all the time. They drove him nuts. He couldn't stand all their quarrels and things, and you know, he had important things to do, and just he wanted them just to get in line, you know, and help him out. Interesting history. Why are there so many memes for the devil? That's a good question. I have no, no idea. Probably again because I suspect it's because um, these different myths that came up for the different times. Because he's like, first of all, he's just kind of Satan, and then he's uh, Lucifer, and then, um, you know, he's um, Beelzebub, you know. Etc. Etc. But that's a good question, Norman. I don't have an answer, really. I suspect it's the different eras in, in whatever literature they adopted. Okay. The devil was kind of a free for all. I mean, you see him in different. You know how they have the vampires with different little things with about the vampires. You know, the early vampire stories have been changed somewhat. I think that's what they were doing with the devil. It evolved. Yeah, it evolved. To suit the contemporary yeah. themes. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, like God has in Jesus. I mean, yeah. now we've got Buddy Jesus. It, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, he's your pal, you know, everything like that. This this was not the vision of Jesus early on. I think if Christians came back from the early church, yeah. they would probably freak out totally. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, so here's a question um, Are agnostics unsure if the devil exists? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wicked. I I think that they're pretty sure that he doesn't. That's, that's a good point. How do they explain evil? Norm's got a sharp mind, I'll yeah. tell you. <laughs> mm -hmm. You should but, ask them that. But really, the serious point in that is if there is no devil, then really the whole concept of God begins to fall apart yeah. as well. Yes, exactly. You could say, well, you still need somebody to create the universe. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't posit this, this entity that would explain why there's evil in the world, <laughs> then why would you have an entity to explain why there's good in the world yeah. either? Because for the world, the universe, you know, who cares whether, you know, a hurricane wipes out you know, New York, because it's just another thing that happens, good, bad, in the world. If it isn't the devil that created the hurricane, it isn't the devil that created New York. Right? Exactly. So exactly. that's where I feel that the devil was so much important to hold the thing together, yeah. this concept of God. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really was. So when you do away with that, but you see, most contemporary Christians, at least from the liberal, more liberal religions, now have kind of done away with the devil. They don't really accept. They actually it. say that. Now, like the there's most. I don't want to. I don't want to be like totally inaccurate, but very, very many Jesuits in the Catholic Church, and you, the ones I'm talking about are the better educated. They don't really believe that there's like a hell so much as like kind of this. They still believe that there's souls and they don't go to heaven, but hell is kind of like an existential place where everybody is like French oh, philosophers. Oh, really? You know, and I wouldn't mind going there. I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah, the, the, they don't uh, say like the, the French judgments? philosophers. Yeah, but you sit around and you're kind of alienated and, and From God. you know, depressed and yeah. And, uh, you can't join. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, like an early stage of existentialism, then funny. You're, then you're smack up against the uh, problem of two worlds again. Yeah. Well, how, how, would, uh, how could God create? Why not? Why? Though? I mean, I guess, the Jesuits still explain that, yeah. but you see the idea not. of hellfire and eternal punishment. It's more this feeling of alienation and, and you know disaffection. You know, it sounds if, if like God a is, lot if of God fun. is outside. If God is outside of time, uh, God exists forever, and, and he's he can't of really. Time. He has to be in time to create. But this how? Do, then he has to come back. He yes, has to come into time. I know. Then, then he makes another. There's another inconsistency. He's sending the devil down into man's realm. Man's <laughs> realm is timed. Yes. 
from the time of birth to the time yes. of death, man is timed yeah. out. Yeah, we're temporal. And he, go, he comes back up with messages, <laughs> so he's interrupting God's omnipotence foreverness <laughs> with this time element. Well, first of all, why does God have this royal court, as it were, or helpers? You don't need this. You can just sit and contemplate just say, your Shabbat. own glory. Or Shabam. Well, or, this is what the this is what the Gnostics were getting in. Mm -hmm. You don't need all this. So, like you know, it's a very complex thing. It's Sophia, mm -hmm. who you know they have this hierarchy of gods, really, the Gnostics, and they have. I'm not explaining it too well, but they have Sophia, who's wisdom. So probably who knows that may have come from the the Jewish really early on, and um, she loves God like so much. And she also wants to be kind of like God, that she almost like tries to merge with him. But in the meantime, she has this fall and she has this intercourse with some other imperfect being and this gives rise to the Demiurge. She kind of gives birth to the Demiurge, at least in one version, because there's a lot of Gnostic versions. And he's the one that like gets screwed up and I can't understand why he does it. But I think he's experimenting or something and, and makes the earth, which really makes a lot of sense really because it, it accounts for a lot of the screwed upness of this of this planet before we knew. Earthquakes, volcanoes. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the, the imperfection of humans too. I mean, they, they explained it really. I think it's a scream. I love it. I just love the whole thing. This concept though, a uh, modern concept of that there's evil that exists they don't use the word devil anymore, but they still say evil. there's such a thing as evil, yeah. like something that comes over you. Yeah. It's evil, it's, it's metaphysical, it's not yeah. uh, part of the, the identifiable universe, it's something that's you know, unexplained. Well, that is all wet as far as I'm yeah. concerned. I think you can but, call it as evil if you want to, if you understand that it's some passion that maybe comes over you. But even the secularists sometimes will say, no, this is the force of evil. This is the force of evil in the world doing this. Well, some of the, Which some gives of the up scholars... Their secular, as soon as that, they say that, they're giving up their secular well, Some of the scholars that I read that have like, done such a great job, toward the end, they, they're, you know, they're unclear as to whether they believe that there's a devil or not. They think there might be that there, there, there's so much evil in the world. Yeah. And then they cite you know, some of these you know, horrific cases. You know. But I think that's easily explained you know, by our screwed up animal That's nature. That's our, yeah, us. It's yeah. Freud called Freud it civilization with, and it's, it's discontent. With the effects of civilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and okay. our environment, yeah, everything. A certain amount of people are bound to go wrong, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also reminded of this great movie, The Last Temptation of Christ. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we should watch Scorsese. that again. Yeah, we I should. I would love to watch that again. Yeah, uh, we should. Because I, I saw it, you know, in the 80s when it came out, but I don't think I was as enthusiastic as I am now about atheism. So I made a point to seeing it, but I didn't really analyze it the way I would today. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think I analyzed it either. You know, I would love to see a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It raised Let's a lot of controversy out. because, you know, mm -hmm. they, they said, no, you're you're misrepresenting Jesus. He wasn't fallible. Because the movie represents him as someone who was uh, guided by the temptation, you know, that he considers joining the devil, you know, sure. the dark side when he's up there on the cross. Sure. So it was quite interesting. But ultimately, you know, it was pro-Jesus in the end anyway. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, I think it, it shows uh, the problems uh, that Christianity would have, and that Paul was really a, uh, a marketeer. He was a, yeah. a merchant <laughs> for the religion. Yeah. You see that very clearly at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it would be a fun movie to watch again. I would. The other thing that I grew up hearing about um, is my father had a little statue of Michelangelo's Moses. Oh, okay, yeah. And Moses was portrayed, and Michelangelo was told to portray him this way with horns. That's that right. Horns. I know which one you mean, yeah. And this propagated this myth that in the Middle Ages that Jews actually had horns. Oh. And they were okay. hiding their horns oh. under their hat. Oh, that's why they wore the hat. Oh, yeah. oh. funny. Yeah. How funny. So, uh, when you talk about that the Jews were uh, portrayed as the devil, yeah. mm -hmm. this is part of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Right. I didn't yeah. come across that yeah. when I was that's researching. Is that you could still find uh -huh. these little statues Residuals. Uh, of, of Moses, probably replica replicas of the Michelangelo that mm -hmm. had horns. I have Moses. seen that. I just, I, you know, I didn't pay a lot of attention. Yeah. 
And you know, then you also have this idea that uh, the black people have tails. And the blacks are evil. That's right. That they have tails like the devil. Well, that's you know that the problem is, and and I'll be getting into that in my thing on, on evolution and um, that is in in science and the conflict between religion as they started to explore in 15 to 1800. The, um, these new peoples came about that they found, or they were new to them. Aborigines, Polynesians, you know, American Indians. Dark, all dark. All dark, yeah. and they were pre-Adamite. Or what were they? Had the devil spawned them? There were all kinds of theological problems mm -hmm. raised by them. Yeah. But I'll be, going, I'll be going into that. And, and you're right, so, many times you're right. those people in the artist's interpretation at that time very put little little tails on them. Yeah, yes they did. Yes they did. I remember some of the art. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they look satanic. And it's sometimes. not it's not trying to make monkeys out of them. No. We used to I used to think, oh they're trying to make monkeys out of them. No, not. no, they're it's trying the to make devil. Satan. They're trying to make devils. Well that's because helpers. they didn't know where they had come from. The Bible doesn't talk about the it. The devil's creation children. Mm -hmm. In Genesis, say problems. <laughs> I love all the problems. That, well, but this is a topic where you really have to begin to analyze. You can't just take what is being stated. There's still, there's this underlying unstated, you have to read between the lines. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it just doesn't make any sense. I agree. And you mentioned yeah, that how the devil had to serve the purposes of the new church. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was had, it had to be uh, enhanced yeah. in order to yeah. enhance Christianity yeah. with it. And I'm sure that carries on later, much, much later as well. Oh, yeah. Well, it gets really bad because, you know, the church is really yeah. threatened despite all its power by this, this reformation. And, you know, they'll never be as powerful again after that. Okay. The, pro the Protestants yeah. now, you know, took a chunk. Yeah. <laughs> and this would be, you know, a fascinating study in film, too, is how the devil has been portrayed in film over the years. Yeah, actually, they have a website, but I mean, I, who had time to get to it, where they have all the films, you know, where the devil is, is portrayed and different. And you notice, basically, I mean, sometimes he's very frightening now, but a lot of times he's almost a comedy-type figure. Yeah. You know, so there again, it shows, you know, the lack of belief, how it's, mm -hmm. how it's really declined to the, the present day. Yeah. I think some very conservative Christians still believe it. I watched a televangelist one day, uh, and he was so funny. He was just milking money out of people because he was telling them that, uh, you know, he was he was southern, so he was doing the thing like, you know, how mad the devil was. You know, the more money that was coming in, and they would tally it, really it makes up. Him and he's going, "Oh, that devil! He's like, you know, jumping up and down, and he's mad, and he can't do anything about it." You know, and, and people were sending him more money. You know, like he was, he was. They were aggravating the devil and like driving him the devil crazy. And this evangelist was getting so much money. You know, it was so funny. And he was depicting the devil. You know, jumping up and down in fury and everything. You know, and. It was really amusing. But how did they solve the problem in the early church of saying, well, man is only being uh, evil because the devil is making him evil as opposed to he's being evil because he himself has chosen that? Well, you, you can see that um, the Lateran Council in 1215 said finally that people chose, chose. you know, evil. They, they chose to follow the devil who had had free will himself and chose evil. So that's how it worked out. But early on, you can see the different versions. You know, did the devil lead people astray, and why did he lead them astray? Is man evil in his nature? And that was in 1200, you said? The, the latter in council, yeah. It, it settled things. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> not for very long mm -hmm. it didn't settle things. So this is a laugh, because you can see that so many things that we've all been taught, and that so many people have been taught are... This is the way it was from very early on, at least 300 solid. or so. Yeah, solid. This is it. This is the Pope decided church this and blah, blah, church yeah. Yeah. Is it? None it's of it not. is. It's, it's all, and it was all in a process of evolution and still is. What? Do you say evolution? <laughs> That's just so funny. Yeah. That's just so funny. It's, it's before your eyes. We go. Societal evolution. It's a evolution. joke. Yeah. Institutional evolution. There's, 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 nothing, there's nothing true about it. It's just... 
All silly. I mean, you were mistaken anything. for the devil worshiper. What was his name? The guy that saw when we went to the uh, the medical exhibit. Oh yeah. The Satanist. What was it? Um, I forget his name, but Mary had said that no, that guy must have passed away a long time ago. Oh yeah, they thought Jim was there. Um, <laughs> Oh my gosh, when we went What's to the medical name? exhibit. The medical exhibit. Yeah, at the at the Isn't this terrible? I can't remember. Corpus Illuminata. Yeah. yeah what Illuminata. was the guy's Corpus name? Uh, he was really famous. Well, he was famous. Isn't that red that uh, silly? Yeah. turtleneck. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, they they were the they were scared. Pen. They were scared. They were a little they concerned. Been, they were a little concerned. The you look yeah. just you look just like so and so. You said you're the reincarnation. Yeah, reincarnation. And I knew the name immediately and I said Oh, this is terrific. <laughs> Actually, he wasn't so much of a devil worshiper. I'm oh. sorry, I can't remember his name, but he was into his own thing, but he was associated yeah. a lot more with the devil than really he was. Mm -hmm. you know? to feel that. Well, I think that what they need, analysis is only good so far. It doesn't, it doesn't it's not fact-based, and these well, people sure. have tried to drag out some, some facts from, from, you know, and they, there is analysis there, the anxieties. They're in a transition. I mean, that's another thing. It was supposed to, everything was supposed to be static, but actually no. that was evolving too. There was a middle class starting to grow up just slowly out of the middle, you know, middle ages into the Renaissance. A psychoanalytic analysis, I don't know that that's always very valid. I'll tell you the truth. That's, that's why well, I have objections to doing that. With but a lot of schizophrenics uh, fantasize that there's this devil or this force of evil that's oh, driving yeah. them yeah, telling them yeah, what to do things, and yeah. that they're struggling themselves between the forces of good and evil. Right. That right. They're trying to fight uh, on the side of good against this evil. Right, right. That's why these ladies kill their children and things. Yeah. yeah, but it reflects this earlier idea that the theologians had that that somehow the humans were going to participate in the war between God and the devil? Yes, that by taking the side of, take of either God or, or the devil. Yeah, if and you were they, doing bad things, you were on the side of the devil. And this goes to the Essenes, that, that they thought that the, the final battle would be simultaneously fought in heaven between the divine forces, God and the devil, and as well as on earth at the same time with the humans oh, also great. battling each There's side. your big cosmic battle. The big your, cosmic your, battle. Your, your combat myth. Yeah, and so it was quite a surprise to them when the Romans wiped them out, you know, because <laughs> they expected to prevail. They had no army. Well, that was the other thing, is that the Essenes weren't really militant in the physical sense. They didn't have an army. That's right. I don't know what they were expecting to do. So it went through moral purity, probably. Yeah, it just doesn't, doesn't really make much sense, though because the Romans that, that surrounded them were so much better armed and ready. Well, if you believe you have God on your side, I mean, you know. Yeah. You don't need, you know, like weaponry, you think. <laughs> it depends how, yeah. you know. You could, you could see that Paul in the movie had distorted what Jesus had was saying originally. I don't remember that part. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Yeah, Paul is my bugaboo. I don't like him, and now it's worse since I read... Um, Freeman, and I'll be discussing that way up ahead in, in the lecture on um, the rise of the church and the, and the war on reason, because that was another big war that the church nicely did, and Paul helped that along greatly early on, because he was really the first one that was like really setting down a certain amount of beliefs and doctrine, and he was doing it, of course, by the seat of his pants, too. But I've always been, because he's part of that Platonist group, and you know I'm not a, I'm not a Platonist at all. What's that? It's uh, people that, you know, follow Plato. Oh, yeah. And that's still a big tendency, I mean, you know, in, the, in, in religion. You know, it, and the Neoplatonism really um, influenced, you know, the, the medieval and, and even the Renaissance church, you know, and I just, I hate it. It's an anti-realist position. I don't like it at all. I mean, these forms. The perfect form. Yeah, this form, and then this tape. There's a perfect yeah. form somewhere, probably in the mind of God, or who knows where. And, yeah. And then this table is this imperfect copy of this. I mean, come on, give me a break. You know? I mean, I've always, I just hated his whole, and he was a, he was a dictator, too. You know, he wanted to have that consul 
kind of, of, of um, guardians who were like very um, enlightened beyond the people and they would set tone and he even wanted to do away with like literature and things like Plato? that. Plato? Yes. 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 It was a imperfect. nasty piece mm -hmm. of work. Yeah. yeah. He was a follower of Socrates early on. He yeah. picked up some of these ideas from Socrates but he really took them and yeah. ran with them. I don't think Socrates would have been into that kind of dictator, mm -hmm. dictor, dictatorial. We don't know for sure, but I'm sure not. Remember, Plato yeah. was very young when he was following Socrates, so his ideas developed. I mean, Socrates took the hemlock, and you know everybody went off to work out their own philosophy at that point. But Plato is so influential still in Western philosophy, and it drives me insane. <laughs> I've always hated it. Remember, I'm a class. I, you know, my minor was in the classics, so you know this is like really important to me. And then, if you'll just look on the web, I mean, you'll find a lot more things dedicated to Socrates and Plato than you'll you'll find on the, you know, like the Sophists, who are very interesting. They're probably a little amoral, but still interesting. Or there are a few of the pre-Socratics. And the Stoics. Yeah, well, the Stoics the they Stoic. believed in a in a god. They were kind of theist. You know, but yeah, they were interesting. But then the Christians borrowed a lot from them, a lot from them, and from Plato. It's disgusting, really. When I think about it, I well, get so angry. It's just, it's just history, Mary. I mean, it's, it's just all part of the human. Uh, but culture. we believe all this now. Yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, existentialism changed a lot, didn't it? Yeah, so, it did, but not enough. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, there's, you know, people who are thinkers or who are liberal, even Christians don't adopt some of these ideas, but there's too many that do. And I would say religion is mainly anti-realist. The this, this scholastics like Thomas Aquinas and everything, they tried to use Aristotle and you know blend these truths of religion and the truths of nature and stuff. So they were less platonic and more Aristotelian. But still, I mean, you know, you still have this like idea, God and his ideas. I mean, you know, it's his, if he created things, these were his ideas to create these things. You still have this. It's, it's like, I, I find it very uh, repulsive. <laughs> I'm sorry. And that's the thing I have against the deconstructivists, too, because they, they, they also had a slight anti-realist position, and that left a little opening there for God, and some of them went that way. Bad, really bad. It's not, it's not uncommon to come across the idea of the, uh, the uh, idea, yeah. the image of the perfect chair, for example. That, that's a very yeah. common example. That's still current today. That come, yeah. you hear, it comes up in literature and so forth. Well, aren't people saying that when they say things? I mean, I hear them on television perfect. sometimes and talk to like Marilyn Williamson and people like that. Well, you know, God, and they all know what God Marianne wants. Williams. Yeah, or whatever her name is, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, they all know what God wants, you know. God doesn't want people to be evil. You know, these are, this is people's choice to be evil or whatever. Well, <laughs> see, there's that thing that, you know, God is perfect. He doesn't want this, but people are doing it. Now we don't even understand why, because we don't believe in the devil very much. <laughs> you know, now we hardly understand why people are doing this. But that hasn't in that theological terms. Yes, I mean, that weakens the concept of God. If the the concept of the devil is weakened, Terrible. the concept of God is weakened. Terrible. As well, and it just comes down to these are just humans behaving good or behaving poorly, mm -hmm. and that's it. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, just people behaving badly, or nature just doing its thing. But who can, you know, people can't stand to think that. That reduces every, every, the importance of everything. If you notice people who are suffering from addiction and, and the ones who will turn to God and get cured, so to speak, of their addiction, mm -hmm. and they'll say, you know, like, uh, God cares about me. Mm -hmm. You know, God doesn't want me to do this to my body. You know, and, and I'm going, you can't do this on your own? I mean, what, yeah. why do you need somebody to care about you? Are you a child? That's the Salvation <laughs> Army model, yeah. Yeah. They claim that to cure addiction through God. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. 
so I mean, I'm making God sad, and I mean, you know, blah, blah. I mean, it's so, it's to me, it's so silly. I mean, I guess it works, so I shouldn't, you know, be negative. I mean, it's better than being, you know, a dope addict, I suppose, or a, or a drunkard, or something like that. But do you really, do you really need that? Are you such a child that you need this, somebody caring for you, up yeah. there? But in a larger scheme, I mean, we need people who are going to take responsibility, right? For, for themselves. themselves. So if, if the addict can't make it, the social Darwinist would say, well, so be it. You know, they're going to take care of themselves. They're going to put them out of their the gene pool. Uh, so I think it's kind of cruel. I mean, it's a it's a it's a cruel statement, but nevertheless, you know, it's going to it's not me dictating it. I'm I'm just I'm an observer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Observing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I I don't object to them. You know using this if they need to get out, get out of their addiction and get their life together somewhat. But it, it does, just seems so doesn't foolish. that perpetuate it onto their children as well? Well, I'm sure that they do, but do their kids, like, believe all that? I mean, you know, we're seeing now, well, you know, we're seeing a lot of young people that don't believe in God at all, and, and you know, they, they were brought up by some of these people that turned mm -hmm. to religion. If you but uh, don't, don't put too much into that. Remember, it's only 20%. But under still 80% of people. You know. well, under 30, it's 33%. Very 33, high. that's right. You're right. Now it's 33%. Now, the Christians would 30, say, well, yeah. but when they get older, they'll turn to God. Yeah, but, they, yeah, but actually... <laughs> because we sure hope so. <laughs> in the last election, they, they were just, their commentators are talking oh, about yes. They said that they don't think that's going to happen. Oh, yes, that's right. They, that's they think that wonderful. because it, the, the, the trend is, it's trending to... If they voted like you know, kind of liberal and non theater or secular, um, they've been doing it now. They have a habit. Yeah. yeah. So who knows? It could change. Yeah, that guess, came up. But yeah, there seems to be a habit, habit now in this country yes. that it's it's <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah. Now let's let's close up nicely and say thank you, and welcome to the first this first lecture of the new year. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> well, I'll be wearing it. All of them. Thank you. To all of us. Thanks for being our leader. Thank yeah. you for coming up with all this. Oh, all absolutely. All spin-offs and everything. This has yeah. been so incredible. Yeah. Don't worry about running out of topics. You're not going to run out of <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think that there's...